Everybody takes a seat. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Good. So, firstly, a big thank you, actually. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming here, and, and uh, especially, as Janice said, on a day which is fantastic weather outside and, and the football. I see there's some colours over there as well, so 6-1, uh, brilliant. Uh, just get that out of the way. Um, and I didn't realise the climate extremes of Brentford, you know, from snow uh, a few months back until to, to, to degrees. So, uh, again, thank you. And also a big thank you for everybody um, who presented and also for me to understand the great work that you do here as a, as a branch. Um, it just blows me away. £37,000. I mean, amazing. And it just allows us to do the, the great work that we do as an association countrywide as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, I'm going to talk about three things, I suppose. Firstly, a small introduction uh, to myself. Talk about me first, which was my favourite topic. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about our care and support services. Um, and then I've been asked to talk a little bit about my initial observations and some sort of strategic thoughts within our care directorate. Um, it was six months in, and that's what it says on the agenda, but um, it's now ten months in, so um, I've got more to talk about. So, a little bit about me, just, just to introduce myself then. So I, my role is, is Director of um, Care Improvement, and I'll just tell you a little bit about what that means in a second. Uh, but my background, uh, it was quite commercial to begin with, really. I, I worked in many different jobs in, in procurement as a buyer for many years. Finished up at Tesco. I was a buyer there for anything that went into a new store without a plug, essentially, for seven countries. So very commercial. But whilst I was there, Tesco uh, became charity of the year for another charity called... Sorry, <laughs> they didn't become charity of the year. WizKids, which is another charity, became charity of the year for Tesco. And I was asked to do some pro bono support and help to buy wheelchairs cheaper. And to be honest, I, um, I enjoyed that better than I did the day job, really. I was going quiet in case someone from Tesco is here listening to this. But, um, so I did this about six, six years, I suppose it was. Um, no, sorry, four years pro bono, and then I joined permanently as director of, of partnerships there uh, for about five and a half years. I really, really loved the third sector and really loved the opportunity to improve healthcare, and um, that was my main role. Uh, whilst there, I also sat as a non-exec director for a couple of other companies. One is the Wound and Lymphedema Service in Myland, and uh, another organisation that uh, 3D prints orthotics, which is uh, another passion of mine, which is around technology, health improvement in that space. Uh, also did a lot of work with government, and I sit on the national. I still sit on the National uh, Wheelchair Alliance, which is uh, set up to improve provision of wheelchairs across the country. And it, it was whilst I was there that I met Karen Pearce, who was our previous director of Care for the South. Uh, and I thought to myself, if everyone was as great as Karen, I would like to join this organisation. And um, when the opportunity came, I, uh, I went for it. Um, and also there's a picture of me there. Unfortunately, I'm not on a Brompton, so I've been out-trumped. Out um, but that was uh, I cycled Lands End to John O'Groats uh, for his kids. And I still like to do a bit of fundraising. So I'm doing London to Paris next month for the association and uh, please come and uh, talk to me about sponsorship. Uh, all money greatly received. Okay, so what, what is my role? Um, there's a few parts to it really. Firstly, it's the overall leadership and, and sort of development and direction of the care and support team that we have in the association and um, it will become clear what we do as I carry on. Um, it's also to ensure that we deliver an equitable and, and the focused, um, focus on positive outcomes for people with MND through the services that we support. So in, in essence what I'm saying is that we want to listen to everybody that is affected by MND and shape our services uh, internally around that input. Uh, and then also it's about improving services through our statutory um, colleagues as well, so be that uh, NHS or local authority. Um, so it's, it's very exciting and I'm very proud to um, stand here and talk to you about it. But firstly, um, there are some slides that are quite kind of common for an AGM, I suppose, around the care and support, and it's just, just to bring you up to date on, on what we do and how we do it. So I'm going to start firstly by talking about care centres, and I'm sure you've all heard of our care centre network. We've got 21 across the country, and actually our 22nd opened this month, it was. Yes. 1st of this month, which is in Stoke, uh, and that's a network. 
supported um, across all of the 22 care centres now, 3,500 people with MD and helping them to access multidisciplinary care um, in those areas. So, fantastic, fantastic network. And I think your nearest here is probably the National Queen's Square, I think. Um, we've touched on it a little bit today already as well, but we also have a team of amazing volunteers, many of them, some of which are in the room today as well, so thank you for your support. Um, and the the key volunteer within care is our AV, uh, who are specially trained volunteers who uh, offer information and practical and emotional support to people affected by MND. Um, as well as being someone to talk to, they're also uh, on hand to help those living with MD navigate the health and social care system as well. Um, and just to, to echo Janice from earlier, just thank you for everybody in the room that, that has that role. Uh, overall, there's over 300 association volunteers associated with the association. This slide talks a little bit about our benefit advice service, and hopefully you've heard of this in the room. Have you all some nodding of heads? Um, it was piloted last year as a, an opportunity to support people to claim the benefits that they are um, eligible, eligible to claim. And it was run as a pilot last year, and we then fully uh, put it into our business as usual, and we support that. And in the eight months to, to the end of the year, so the last eight months of last year, we um, allowed, identified over a million pounds of benefit to people living with MD, which is just amazing. And already in the first five months of this year, um, that's 810,000 pounds of benefits that have been um, uh, people have been made aware of and that they can claim. So I, I think that's just a, an amazing story. Uh, we also have our MND Connect helpline, um, and the number's there. It did change last year, so hopefully you've all got this, this new uh, number. Uh, and last year the team responded to 8,600 requests for help, and that's through telephone, through email, and through um, an online forum as well. Uh, as well as the, there we go. Um, as well as the uh, Connect Helpline, we have a range of information, fact sheets, and uh, publications. And there's some on the table over there that I noticed. So please do have a look. And some fantastic figures there. So over 55,000 publications were downloaded from our website, and 37,000 fact sheets and publications were distributed last year. So huge scope. And we've also won awards for this uh, this piece of work. Um, some of, some of the, the resources that we produce, uh, and they are being used across different countries as well. So, as, as well as that, we have uh, a number of pieces of equipment that we loan, and there's some pictures of them there. As you can see, riser recliner chairs, um, light writers, allurers, um, and iPads, voice ampl amplifiers for voice banking, uh, to name some. So last year we supported 553 chairs, essentially, that were loaned out, and uh, 61 light writers as well. But that just the demand continues to sort of increase for those uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, we, did, we, we touched on this earlier as well, which was our, our care and support grants, and there's four there, which um, you can all read through, and they're available to read about on the, uh, on the website. But the figure here to talk to you about is a million pounds was the, the circa figure that we used, um, that we supported people on through grants last year, uh, which is a huge amount, supporting 1,500 people. And some of those are available um, through um, branches and groups, and others, such as the care grant, are an assessed need that have to be um, sent through the head, head office. Wheelchairs, uh, again, we offer um, a service to provide information, advice, and, and low-level advocacy for wheelchairs. This is very much a service that should be a statutory service, but we know quite often it's very difficult for people to access uh, wheelchairs quickly. Um, and so we have some stock in some places, uh, and we have a, a lady that we've just uh, recruited to, um, to this role called uh, Debbie, who's based in our uh, office in London, not in London, in Northampton. And uh, if you have any questions around wheelchair provision, she's the lady to call through the um, MND Connect Helpline. So in 2017, a total of 89 applications were approved 
with a total of 70, which was 72,000 pounds worth of um, grants to, to, to um, help with this application process for wheelchairs, which is amazing. So support grants and equipment loan requests for communication aids or voice banking devices are also processed and funded centrally through um, uh, David Nivenhouse. And in 2017 we funded 111 applications for communication aids or, or apps associated with that, uh, which was just over £40,000. Uh, there's a couple of other projects that we are also looking to support, uh, we are, well we are supporting. Uh, provision of AAC assessment kit for local speech and language therapists, so we provide uh, equipment to those speech and language therapists. And um, we're currently uh, piloting a voice banking volunteer project as well uh, across the country. And finally, on this little section, just as a, uh, an update to you for what's going on in care support, is the NICE guidelines. We did touch on this earlier. Um, but so far we've developed um, information for people affected by MD to help um, understand what the guidance actually says and what, what it looks like. So that we've actually, I don't know whether you've seen it, there's a small um, leaflet which is available for you to, to take away, to take into uh, your discussions with healthcare professionals. Um, and we've been promoting the guidelines uh, across the NHS and social, social services. And we've audited it as well. So we, um, through our care centre network, we produced an audit tool which we challenged our care centres to complete, um, and we assessed their provision against the NICE guidelines. And there is actually a State of the Nation report which was launched uh, last week at our care centre directors conference, and uh, that's available on the website. So come and see me afterwards if you uh, would like to know where that is. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure we can we can circulate that around. Okay, so I now wanted to, it's a bit more sort of free flow now, they're my slides that I wanted to update you on, but um, I wanted to now talk a little bit about my, my observations, as I said, sort of kind of new into rock or new ish into rock. So, firstly, I just wanted to sort of set the scene in terms of the environment that we're working in at the moment, and, and again, this has been touched on a little bit already. Um, and it paints a little bit of a <laughs> doom and gloom story, but it, I suppose it's the world that we live in. So, firstly, cuts to public spending. You know, disability benefits are under pressure, there's eligibility limitations for lots of different areas. Um, NHS and statutory services are under more pressure now than they've ever been. Uh, social care and support service are in the same camp, really. There's an increased demand, more, more complex requirements um, with an aging population. Um, also, for, for us as a third sector organisation, you know, it's a difficult environment. We've got, um, in last year, was it last year? The year before now, probably the year before, the output from the kids' company in Ox, Oxfam was last year on safeguarding. So we, we've really had to make sure that we're um, leading the pack on, on those areas and we're working to really robust safeguarding um, uh, processes and policies. And also data protection, which I'm sure you, <laughs> you're fully aware of. Um, also internally, you know, we've got competing projects as a, as a care director, care and support director, and as an association. So you see our the CRM system, which is our new computer system, is being implemented this year. We've got a new website that we're, we're developing. GDPR I've talked about. Um, so there's lots of competing projects that is sort of we're, we're operating um, against. And so there's this real balance between where we spend our time and our money versus the impact of that money time has for people living with MD, because at the end of the day that's why we're here. And I'll come on to that. But but we have come a long way. I couldn't resist that picture. You might know the, the gentleman there. I love seeing a president uh, getting soaking wet. Always a good sign. So one of the three key priorities is the, for the association alongside our research and our awareness is to um, ensure that people um, living with MD can access appropriate care when they need it. And so we do that through a number of different ways. I've already talked about the care centres, so we've got our 22 care centres. That is, a, in terms of how much that costs us, that's around £1.2 million pounds a year that we have to fundraise to support those centres. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's a large amount of money. The ice bucket um, challenge uh, allowed us to take the opportunity to fund a number of different posts across the country. Um, so we supported 13 
uh, NHS MND practitioners across, um, across the whole of uh, England, North, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales. And they were roles such as coordination posts, they were uh, average practitioners and specialist nurses. And that was just over half a million pounds that we spent on that. And we continue to spend some of those roles still ongoing. But it was always the long-term approach that those roles um, would, be, would be funded ultimately by the NHS. So there's a lot of work being carried out by our local care teams, our regional development managers, our RDMs, and our regional um, care team to make sure that, that is the case. It's really hard when there's no money in the system, so um, yeah, we're doing all we can. Um, and then we also fund, as I said, our equipment and our uh, other forms of care support. So all of these things have to be put into the mix when we're deciding where to spend our money. Um, some other observations, I suppose, for me, are care and support isn't always received equitably across the country. And that's, um, we can say that about local authority and we can say that about NHS and statutory services. I've seen it, especially within the wheelchair world. Uh, but I think there's probably a little bit of that for our own services. So we really need to make sure that what we are funding is um, equitable for everyone across the country. Um, I've talked already about money and the situation that we <coughs> find ourselves in and we operate it against. Um, but also patients or people living with MD require uh, more support with less money available. So I've already touched on these really. Um, but having said that, the future, I think, is, is extremely bright. You know, we've got a fantastic team of permanent and voluntary staff uh, who are dedicated, enthusiastic, uh, extremely knowledgeable and professional, um, and they have massive impact on people affected by MND. So that's, I'm very proud of the, of the people that I work with and uh, the volunteers that, that, we, that support the association. Um, we've got a fantastic branch and group structure. I, I came from a charity that didn't have that of the structure and it's a real eye you know, Branches and groups are absolutely the lifeblood of the organisation and um, I think that's just a fantastic asset that we've got. Um, and we do have good partnerships with the NHS. We do have good partnerships with local authority, you know, through the, the charter that we were talking about earlier, um, but also through our networks and our association um, contacts that we've got. Um, so, so the future is really bright. But where, where I suppose does all this lead us? Um, we are organic as an association, so we will continue to evolve over time. Um, and, uh, and perhaps inevitably the future will look sort of very different to the past in that the Ice Bucket Challenge money was amazing, but it was a one-off, and that money is either allocated or spent now. Um, so the future is going to be a bit tighter in terms of, of cash and where we are. Um, and this is against sort of internal and external expectations that we um, will continue to, to grow and, and to continue to support more people. Um, so this, problem, so this, all of this sort of factors into my strategic thinking really and, and I want us to concentrate today on probably two areas. Um, one is about how we, how we access information and use that information to support people but also how do we make our care services sustainable going forward. And uh, How long have I got? Another five, ten minutes? So, and do stop me if you have questions as I go along, otherwise I will just continue to talk. Um, so this is my attempt at a sort of my brain on a piece of paper, I suppose, and looking at, you know, the opportunity to listen to our stakeholders, is what this is trying to say. So we, we have a wide ranging network of information that comes into the association, and we love an acronym, and I've tried, <coughs> hopefully I haven't got any on there. But you, you will see that um, you know, we get information through our, our Connect helpline, for example. We get people living with MND provide information, families do, health and social care professionals, um, social media, you know, and all of you can see them all up there, and, and it's not an exhaustive list either, there's more. So we need to listen to that. We need to listen to the information that comes in and do something with that and to aid our decision making. And two great examples of so specifically where we can use that information is through our MND care survey, which was completed uh, was completed every year, but last year was our biggest um, survey with 1,400 people, I, both people affected with MND and also carers that filled in that, that uh, survey. And our MND audit, our transforming care audit, which is the one I just talked to, talked to you about, which is the audit that the care centres fill in and um, 
assess themselves against the NICE guidelines. But imperatively, what, what we have to do is we have to gather this information, we have to filter it, and we have to use it. And um, I'm doing all I can to figure out the best way of doing that. And I think we can use technology, and we can use um, you know, this fantastic network of people that we've got already. So you watch this space on that. It's not, it's not the easiest of tasks, because then you know, what, what do you do with that information? But I'm personally based in Northampton and in London, and I'm this almost sort of the conduit between our care director and our external affairs director. So again, that's that's a new that's a new role really, in that we can then use all this information to directly campaign uh, and for policy change and for um, changes to services. Um, and I think finally, in this area, we could do more in terms of something like a patient advisory board. You know, engaging more with people um, that actually have MND and talking to the people that we support in a much better way. So I'm again doing everything I can to make sure we shape um, what that looks like going forward. Okay. So, this is the interesting bit. <laughs> so how does all this actually work? <laughs> um, so, I think what is probably the best place to start is to say what is the context of what we want to achieve as an association? So if you look at our strategic principles for care and support, uh, there's four of them, and I'll run you through them. Firstly, the statutory sector is to provide core items for the care of people affected by MD. In other words, we won't, we won't provide care. Yeah, we'll support people, but we, it's not our responsibility to actually do that. Uh, we, but, but, having said that, we won't walk away from anybody that's um, in need as well. Um, so quite often that can be kind of two ends of the spectrum because you know we won't walk away but we won't support so we have to find a, a, an interim. Um, we'll also, I'm sorry, where we identify that we are stepping into funds, we'll hold discussions with funders and commissioners to pick up that funding. So like we did with the 13 posts for the ice bucket money, we will we identified a need, it wasn't there, we filled it, but we're having conversations with the purse string holders to actually make sure that they fund that going forward. And finally, our role is to add value. So um, this might be some, you know, com this might complement statutory service and statutory provision. Um, so, for an example, of this would be coordination of care. So we would absolutely support that because that role as an MND coordinator of care doesn't exist within the NHS, but we provide that. Hope that's clear. Does that? Yeah. Um, In terms of our services then, looking forward, the care centre network, I'll start there. As I say, there's 22, but e each year we've got an, uh, an ongoing renewal process. So this year we have two of the care centres that were renewed. Next year we've got six, then five, and then eight. So this, and it will continue. As, we, as, the, as the contracts come to an end, we have to decide what we're doing with those care centres. So uh, we will continue to challenge them. We'll continue to make sure that they're adding value and that they tick these four boxes that I've just mentioned to you. Um, but we also will make sure that we assess the impact of those services. Um, and not just care centres, but also all the other services that I've talked about. If the impact isn't there anymore, or we, we need to tweak it, we need to change it, we will do that. Um, we will continue to ask ourselves, are we spending money in the right place? So, coordination of care, I've talked about, but should we be spending money on that service or should we spend it on equipment or education or research? You know, do we have the tools in place to be able to make those, those, those statements and those judgments? Um, collaboration with healthcare professionals is also really key and we'll make sure we do that. And one example of that is I'm looking at um, personal health budgets at the moment and, and how people with neurological conditions can uh, benefit from that sort of approach and some will and some won't and you know we're looking to pilot that. Um, sustainability and equitability of our services, we need to keep asking the question is, is it equitable? And, um, and finally also it's about identifying that the, the, the care centres that we've got and the, net, the network of, of healthcare professionals and grants that we, we give to those professionals it's not where it starts and ends. There's also a huge number of multidisciplinary teams across the country away outside of those networks. So we, um, we, we identify that. We need to make sure that we're working with multidisciplinary teams outside 
um, of, of the care service network as well. So, just, well, I suppose the final comment for me, you'll be pleased to hear, is that um, I think, as I mentioned, ongoing growth in the way we've done it is probably unlikely going forward. But we're just going to do it in a different way. We will flex and we will change as we come back to our kind of financial balance. Um, so we're in a time of transition and um, this sort of new challenge within the financial constraints of the world that we live in, I've, I've talked about. Um, but luckily we've got a great team. We've got a fantastic um, care and support directorate and I'm very proud to lead them. And uh, um, we've got an amazing volunteering network and, and branch group network as well. So as we progress and go forward, we'll absolutely make sure we're engaging across all of our volunteering network. I hope that helps, and I hope, I hope you found that interesting. Other than that, any questions? Good, I'm off. You said that you were assessed the care centres. Um, what was the yeah, you, you said that you assessed when you were doing the applications. That you assessed them. Was it four main points that you checked? What, what were they? Yeah. Well, there's more than there will be more than four. Um, but the where is it? Let me find it for you. But the, the four strategic principles that we have uh, are um, statutory sector to provide the core items for people affected by MND. Uh, we won't walk away from a person affected by MND, but we expect statutory services to support them and we will hold them to account when they don't. Uh, where, we, where we identify that we're stepping into fund, we would hold discussions with funders and commissioners to pick up that funding. And our, our, our role is to add value, so this may complement statutory provision. That's not quite what I meant, it's when you, when you were assessing uh, the applications for centres. Well, so against those principles, what, what we're going to do, and this is work in progress at the moment, is that we, we have a, well, we do have a very robust governance. So we have a care committee that meet and they assess the applications that come in for the renewal of all grants for care. But there is scope to change that and to improve it even further. And so I'm taking a, a proposal to our care committee next month, which is looking at the criteria that we use to assess against that. questions if you stick around just for a few minutes and have a, a direct chat with uh, with Nick that would be great I mean as a trustee I can if I'd just like to add that a great I'm very aware that a great deal of thought goes into the strategy for the association the changes that need to be made we are obviously operating as, as Nick said in very difficult times um, and um, but I, I can say that we do have a fantastic team uh, running this, so I'm very confident that, um, that the progress will be made and will be made along the right lines. But big thanks to Nick for giving up his um, Sunday afternoon, football afternoon, to come and talk to us. Um, and again, a very big thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, if I could just remind you that our next open meeting will be on um, Sunday the 16th of September where we will be talking about um, voice banking and communications aids. So many of you know Helen Patterson, who has very kindly come along today, um, and she is going to be leading this session, which is about communications, aid, uh, communication aids and voice banking. And Karen Pierce was mentioned, who used to be uh, Director of Care for South. She hasn't uh, we haven't lost her entirely and she's now volunteering with us as a voice banking volunteer and she's going to come along as part of that uh, to, talk about, uh, to talk about what she's been doing. So I think it will be a very interesting session and I hope we'll see a lot of you there. Um, 
In the meantime, I obviously hope I'm going to see you before then, in July, at the walk. Uh, we still have, I believe, I haven't looked, but I'm assuming, oh, not that much, there is still some cake left, so um, please help yourselves, and uh, thanks again.